Okay, so uh, let's just get started. First of all, um, just as a quick overview, um, we're going to focus on pre-production and camera skills, and then we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. Um, it'd be really handy if you have pen and paper, because there's a fair bit of info. We're obviously not going to try and get to the stage where we are going to put Napier University out of business, you know, or anything like that, because obviously we're just doing a sort of um, kind of basic overview of basic skills. But hopefully you're going to get something out of this and, you know, it'll be useful for you. This course is a starting point, but there's always going to be more to learn. And the best way to learn is always to get more practice. So just to pick up your camera and shoot. Anyway, let's get started. So first of all, what is pre-production? Okay, so basically there's three stages of production. You have pre-production, production and post-production. And basically those are all different stages. So um, pre-production is your planning and everything that you kind of have to do before you start actually shooting. Production is your um, stage of actually going out, filming it, doing it. And post-production is when you get back home, you've got in the editing computer, you're chopping it all up, you're putting it all together, and that's when you kind of produce the final thing. A red flag you've got to watch out for is when people say, we'll fix it in post. Because if somebody says, we'll fix it in post, it basically just means they're probably winging it, or it means that they don't they don't really know how they're going to fix a problem, but they're just hoping they'll be able to work it out later on. Um, if somebody says, we'll fix it in post, the best thing to do is say, no, we're going to fix it now. And this actually is applicable to all different types of camera skills, filmmaking, video production. So it doesn't matter if you're making um, a narrative drama for television, it doesn't matter if you're making a promotional video, just a quick thing um, on your phone to stick on your social media platforms, it doesn't matter if it's just to promote some of your own kind of like creative work. No matter what you're doing, it's important to think of it in terms of three stages of production, pre-production, production and post-production, because that will help you massively. It doesn't matter what you're actually, um, what the style or the genre of what you're producing is, it will be very effective for you. So what's involved in pre-production? Well, obviously it's planning, that can involve writing scripts, drawing storyboards, scheduling, sourcing props, uh, preparing the location and the environment. Um, plan will save you time and stress and make the project more efficient. And I know this might sound really basic because a lot of you are going to think, well, of course I'm going to plan it before I do it. But you'd be surprised how much stuff you can overlook. And then when you get there, you um, suddenly think, oh, we didn't think of that. Um, it's a significant part of the process, um, particularly the more complex stuff that you're doing. So let's run through a few things that are kind of important. Structure and scripting. What do I mean by that? I don't actually mean that you necessarily have to have a big comprehensive script in terms of what you are going to say word for word verbatim. Um, basically just, it's a useful way in which you can focus what you're going to say and get across the key messages. So even if you're just making a bullet point list and basically all you're gonna do is get a pen and paper and you're just gonna write down, this is point one, point two, point three. If you have that in front of you, if you read it before you start, you actually are going to be able to communicate those key messages beforehand. Um, think of the structure. You want to make sure that you've got a hook right at the start to get people interested. Um, you don't want to start by saying, hi, I'm so and so, and it loses people, et cetera, et cetera. You want, to be some, you want to have some sort of hook that gets people involved straight away. Something like, we're going to tell you a really exciting update, or you know, we've got something really exciting to tell you. Just think about the tone, think about the words. Depending on what you're trying to do, you want to make sure that your word choice is um, kind of exciting or serious, or just think a lot about how you're trying to actually um, communicate or what you want to communicate. Uh, you want to practice reading it before you do it. Um, and as I say, it doesn't need to be a full script, um, but you'd be surprised the difference it makes if you just bullet point what you want to say before you say it and then stick to that versus just turn on the camera and hope for the best like makes a big difference um don't be afraid to ask for help get a second opinion and um this also works if you're doing an interview with someone so say you're filming an interview um like with um a guest or a client or something like that and um, talk to them beforehand about what you're going to say and if it's both of you on camera talk about how you're going to bounce off each other uh make sure you just have that down and structure it a little bit it'll help both of you Storyboarding. So this is kind of when it starts a bit more technical. Okay, so storyboards are kind of like comic books. That one on the right is from Star Wars. So basically, um, storyboards are kind of similar to comic books, right? And basically, if you pick up a storyboard and you flick through it, you're able to see how a film is put together in terms of the composition of the shots and etc., um, all the different angles. And it gives a very clear demonstration. Obviously, if you are a camera operator and uh, you have a set of storyboards that you've planned in advance, then you know exactly what you need to prepare for each individual shot. This actually makes a significant difference because if you turn up on set and you're like, okay, well, what shots do we need? And you think, I don't know, let's find out. And then you wing it. And then, of course, you're, you're trying to put stuff together. You need to have enough shots to cover all the angles. You need to have enough shots that you can actually cut between and create a story out of. And again, this is also relevant even for things like corporate videos, promotional videos, weddings. You need to have enough angles. So storyboarding a little bit will actually make a big difference to you. Winging it is never advisable. 
So what if you're not particularly good at drawing? Well, obviously, if, you, if you're you know, a skilled illustrator, you're going to have an advantage here. Um, but um, don't worry too much, because you can just use things like stick figures and just draw things in close up with stick figures and all the rest of it. There's a couple of examples on the next page. Um, but you know, most feature films now, in fact, pretty much all feature films now are storyboarded. Um, and uh, it will be helpful no matter what kind of production you're doing. Um, there's a couple that I've done on projects. Um, as a wee quick activity for you, if you've got pen and paper, I would recommend just getting a line for the middle of a page and two other lines, two vertical lines, great wee storyboard. Once you're done, let's just draw some, uh, once we're done with the session, draw some uh, illustrations in each of the panels and create like a wee storyboard for yourself and then just film it on your phone. Um, and you'll be amazed at how much that process of just actually thinking about it will actually make a big difference. Um, there's also templates online, um, which you can get. Um, but I mean, to be honest, you don't really need a template. It's like, it's a grid of six squares or rectangles. Like, you know, anyone can do it. Cool. We're also going to talk about location and the environment. Um, you need to think about where you're going to shoot. You need to make sure that you've got permission to film there. You need to make sure that the weather is going to be okay if it's outside. Um, so you've got to look at the forecast. Um, if you're filming in a public space, you need to make sure that you've got permission and that you um, are aware of people as they're moving about. You know, you've got to bear in mind things about your privacy. You have to think about um, health and safety. So you've got to think about, you know, where you're shooting. Don't film next to a busy road or where you might cause an obstruction, cause people to trip up. Um, if you've got lots of equipment everywhere, um, you've got to think about that too. Um, is anyone going to pinch it? <laughs> you know, um, if the environment's loud, then you might not be able to record sound. Um, if you are in the house, turn off the television, don't film with music playing. That's a disaster. Never do that. Um, and then you might have to ask people to be quiet if there's a lot of people around. But you also need to make sure you've got a backup plan and be prepared to move, possibly at short notice. So all of these things need to be thought through before you get on set. Now, the reason I've got the two pictures on the right, um, that's from a short film that I directed called Cold, um, which we did uh, last year. Now, Cold, as you can see, is obviously set at Christmas time. So in order to actually get the location that we needed, we had to wait for a very specific time of year, which was November, December, um, in order to actually get those shots. And obviously, we're filming in a town centre in that shot. So think about the logistics that are involved in that. You've got traffic, you've got people going by. So in order to mitigate that, we also have potentially have weather issues. So we have to compensate for that and have a backup plan. Now, in a situation where you've got lots of people around, the best thing to do is try and work out which time of day is going to be the quietest, film around that. If you've got loads of traffic, same thing. It's all just trying to about think and plan ahead. The worst thing to do is just grab the camera and go and think you just, you know, it'll be fine. It might be fine, but you could be bringing a lot of um, logistical challenges on yourself. So overshooting is when you shoot too much material and you have loads and loads of material that you're never going to use. So if you pick up the camera and you're really excited, and particularly if you're a little bit inexperienced, one of the things you want to do is just shoot everything. We'll shoot that, we'll shoot that, we'll shoot that. And again, if you're doing like a, doing like a wee promotional thing, even for like, say it was like a, this happens a lot with schools, for example. So if I'm doing a project that involves um, filming with schools, there's a desire that teachers have to get every single pupil every single teacher, every single project onto the, the video. And if the video is only gonna be about a minute and a half, you can't include every pupil, every teacher, every classroom, it just, it just it can't be done. But of course, when you're there on the day, they're like, oh, just come in here, we'll just film this classroom. Oh, we'll just come in here, we'll film this classroom. And you can see how very quickly that becomes too much. And you're then in a horrible position when you've got all this material, you can't use it all. And this is a problem um, for all different types of projects, but particularly ones with large groups of people. So um, one way to get around that obviously is to try and get as many people together on a shot at once. But the other thing to do is also, you have to kind of think about ahead of time, how you're going to deal with that. If people are going to turn around and say, oh, let's get this and let's get that and let's get this and get that. Or if you yourself are out filming something that's very interesting, beautiful, fascinating, that you don't spend forever with a camera just shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting. You've been there for four hours. By the time you get back and you've got to actually put it together, you're like, I don't know where to begin cutting all this. Um, so try not to be, well, you can be spontaneous and get, you know, stuff that's sort of like cool when it happens and you just go with it, but don't get too much material that you're never going to use. So again, things like a shot list, um, most of the shots that you need and the storyboards will help with that. Um, but you want to strike a balance because, you know, on, on balance, it is always better to have too much than too little because there's nothing worse than not having enough material to make a, make a thing come together, make a video come together. But you really want to make sure that you don't overshoot and you end up with just gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes on your hard drive that you're never going to use um, but yeah experience will help with this so yeah filming live yeah that's a big thing um so you see on the right that's back when i worked and did sky news coverage um and you see the presenter james matthews you remember him because he was the guy who 
when um, there was the, the Icelandic volcano eruption, um, he was at Edinburgh Airport and the guy came up behind him and started shouting, I hate Iceland, I hate Iceland. And that was, that was him, that happened to him. And that's a good example of um, how like shooting live, you can't necessarily control your environment. So um, obviously that introduces new challenges. Um, so if you're in a public environment, you've got to think about how you're going to mitigate heckling or harassment. You could do that, for example, by um, having someone with you who can sort of keep an eye, keep a watch, et cetera, maybe tap you on the shoulder if something, you know, if situations emerging. You need to have a clear plan when you're doing this. Also, if you're filming live, like I'm doing right now, um, you need to have a very clear structure and a plan, um, or why you should end up rambling. So if I tried to do this presentation and I had prepared a slideshow, um, I'd be rambling and basically just talking about nonsense. Um, so you kind of have to think ahead of that. If you're filming live or if you're broadcasting live, you have to make sure that you you have a plan ahead of time, especially if you're going to promote or advertise something, because otherwise you're just going to speak for four or five minutes and then right at the end, oh, I forgot to mention that, you know, it's a little bit awkward. Um, you can't do another take as well because it's already been broadcast. So in that situation, think about why we're doing a pre-recorded video might be more appropriate. Um, and um, yeah, like if you film and edit a production rather than broadcast it live, you'll have more control over it. It will take more time, but you know, it gives you a lot more options. So yeah, just bringing it all together then, um, you can work on your presenting style by practicing in front of a mirror, um, which I recommend. Um, don't rush when you're um, planning your schedule. Make sure you have enough time when you're actually shooting. So a big common problem is people say, oh, we'll do that, we'll do that, we'll do that. And then we'll get lunch and we'll do that, and we'll do that, and we'll do that. And then what you don't realize is to get those first three things in the morning is actually taking several hours. And by the time you're gonna get lunch, it's maybe four in the afternoon. So try and schedule your time appropriately. Um, consider if you're going to need things like costumes or props or extra materials. And that could be as simple as if you need to hold up a sign or if you have a product, you need to make sure that you have it with you. Um, if you need to turn up somewhere and you're like, oh, I forgot to bring that, and you've got to run back and get it or whatever, you're going to um, introduce what's the stress. Yeah, so just make sure that you're prepared with your costumes, your props and your extra materials well beforehand. Allocate a budget if you need to. So if you need to like, buy those props or buy a sign or a banner to hold up or whatever. Um, if there's people involved, call them up beforehand, have a team call maybe the day before, um, have a briefing on the day before you get started. Don't just start shooting and think, right, what are we doing? Because that won't work well and everyone's going to get confused and feel a bit awkward and uncomfortable. Um, and also, um, this is quite important, um, you can consider getting a written consent form for participants and that's because it'll be GDPR compliant if it's obviously a business related thing. Um, but also, um, you have to think about this in terms of if you fall out with someone and they decide they don't want to be, they want to be part of it, say you've got a big project that's got 20 people on it and one person says, I don't want to be part of this anymore. They've got a written agreement, then you're covered. Um, but if they basically say, do you know what, I don't want to be part of this anymore and can you remove my part of it? If they're in every shot, then you either have to digitally remove them all or you have to get rid of the video. So that could be a real just thing you've got to think about because um, obviously you want to be GDPR compliant and you have to respect privacy. So yeah, that's just something to think about. Um, those are just final pre-production notes, uh, kind of bring it all together. Um, yeah. To be fair, I would say I'm kind of aware of the fact that most of you guys will probably be more interested in the camera skill side of things, um, which is fine. Um, so we're going to go into that now. Um, but uh, yeah, I do think pre-production is really, really fundamentally important and a lot of people overlook it. So please, if you are going to start filming, give a consideration to those things before you start. Um, it will make your life so much simpler. Okay, so following pre-production, we're going to go into um, production and that involves camera skills. Um, and obviously camera skills are essential um, if you're gonna have good video quality production. One thing to bear in mind is that the quality of your camera doesn't necessarily matter as much as the actual shots that you put up there. So the tech specs, you might get the fanciest phone with the fanciest camera or a really funky DSLR or spend loads of money getting something that shoots in 4K, you know, blah, 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 these many specs, et cetera. But if the shots are rubbish, then it's meaningless. So the footage needs to be interesting, creative, queer, and visually appealing, as I've listed there. Um, and that is the way in which you'll be able to communicate much more effectively. So how do you do that? Okay, well, first of all, there's different types of cameras. They all do different things. They're all basically digital now. They used to be on film, but they're not anymore. And obviously, depending on your budget, depending on your needs, you might think you can get by fine on a mobile phone camera. You probably can. Um, you might think, you know what, I want to step up, want to get a big DSLR or whatever. Cool. The only thing that matters is, is what you're using it for. Um, you're obviously not going to be able to use like a mobile phone camera to get big, beautiful aerial drone shots. So it really just kind of depends what you're using it for. Mobile phone is probably the most common type. And I anticipated that everyone who would be on this call would probably be using mobile phones more than any other type. You know, that's fine. There are some amazing um, mobile phone um, uh, productions that are actually out there now. Some feature films are filmed on mobile phones. Uh, a couple of examples on the right. 
have not seen either of them, but I hear they're good. One's called uh, Snow Steam Iron and the other one's called Night Fishing. But the thing to bear in mind again is that just because you've got a good phone camera, and some of them are fantastic, um, you still need to compose good shots. Um, so again, it's not about the tech specs, it's about what you actually put on screen. Okay, so starting off with the basics. This is very basic and you're probably already aware of this, but you have two different types. You have a portrait and you have a landscape. And basically, your portrait shots are vertical, your landscape shots are horizontal. Um, it's 99% of the time always better to shoot in a landscape. Um, so the only disadvantage with that is that if you're holding your mobile phone, um, a lot of people find it easier just to hold it in portrait because it kind of fits the hand better. If you hold it in a landscape, you kind of have to turn your hand at an angle or it feels a bit uncomfortable or you don't have as much headspace to move around. And yeah, if you actually just um, open your camera app and try it just now, just in front of you, you'll feel the difference if you hold it for like a long period of time. Um, there's also a one by one format, which is basically a square. And um, that's uh, increasingly popular because of things like Instagram. Um, but I'll be honest, if you're in video editing, you hate portrait footage. And the reason for that is because um, it's really difficult to get a nice background. Um, typically it's all shot on mobile phone and it just looks less professional in general. Um, sure, it's kind of standardized to an extent on social media, but if you're doing a professional production that's gonna end up on TV, um, you know, it's really hard. Cause if you, if you have um, portrait footage and you want to stick that on a television or a screen, um, you're playing with these big black bars on the, on the side, cause obviously there's not enough footage to fill the stage. So yeah, we have to zoom in massively to fill it, in which case the face is like blown up because you're trying to fill on the screen um, or you've got these black bars on the side. So it's not ideal. So if possible, I'd always recommend shooting in landscape unless you're doing something quick and, and cheerful and it's just, you know, for five minutes or whatever. Yeah, so the other thing is composition. Um, so one of the most important factors is how you're actually gonna compose your shots. Um, now, if you've got experience in photography or illustration, then obviously that's gonna come quite simple, simple to you. Um, but um, even if you're not a particularly skilled illustrator or photographer or any of those kind of things, and you don't feel like you're particularly good when it comes to visual kind of you know, composition, there's a few rules that we can kind of teach you which you might find really useful. Um, so those kind of shots there are, are two I just found that were quite nice. Um, obviously, I really like the, the fourth um, bridge one there because it's such a sort of dynamic angular composition. You can see obviously the wine just cuts straight away through the diagonal. And I just think that's a really effective way to catch the eye. Okay, so again, coming back to this one, um, cold. So if we think about the composition and not to kind of um, talk too much about more work, but um, we put a lot of thought into this shot in terms of how the composition would be used to express different kind of uh, metaphors and character themes. So for example, in this one uh, from cold, um, you have um, an actor and actress on the left and the right. First of all, um, the actor on the left fills a lot more of the frame and he's above kind of towering over the other figure. Now, uh, the woman on the right um, is much smaller in the frame. Um, she seems to be kind of boxed in almost, so um, by the environment. Now that implies a power dynamic between the two. It implies that basically the first person is more dominant and that the second person is more submissive or sort of strong versus weak. Um, there's a power dynamic at play there. The way in which your characters are framed in terms of height uh, will imply a lot of different things in terms of their kind of um, their confidence levels um, their, uh, all this kind of relationship, you know. There's also, um, in terms of the composition, a physical boundary that exists near the middle between the two. So it kind of implies a divide between the two. So on the one hand, you have a background which one character inhabits, and on the other hand, you've got a background the other character inhabits. And the fact that there's a physical division between these two implies that there's division between them. Now, oftentimes these things are visual metaphors and they're not necessarily things that you are conscious of, but your brain will process these regardless. It's sort of on a subconscious level. Um, that's why some of the most effective um, pieces of art, et cetera, obviously getting into that kind of stuff is very subjective, but um, it all kind of works in terms of communicating with you on a kind of a subconscious uh, level. Your, your, your mind when your brain will pick up on these kind of cues and understand the kind of visual metaphors at play, um, even if you're not necessarily conscious of it. So you think about some of the classic films, um, obviously there's like Casablanca there, um, putting characters close together in a frame will imply intimacy. Um, and then that's obviously Casablanca on the top. In the bottom, in the uh, shadows, we've got the Godfather there. Um, so if you think about that, you've got big distance between these characters. Um, you've got um, uh, Marlon Brando's in shadow in, in the, you know, right in the kind of corner, um, but kind of dominating the frame because he's so large in terms of his, um, his presence. The other character very far away, 
um, you know, implies distance, implies an intimidating kind of relationship, um, implies mystery. Um, all of these different things are kind of at play with the visual metaphors. So um, to get some kind of very simple ones, um, obviously to run through the list I've made there, a character in darkness is more mysterious or possibly keeping secrets. Um, keeps people close together implies a close relationship. Physical distance, a distant relationship. Um, looking down at someone is intimidating. Looking up at someone kind of gives power to them. Um, and uh, filling space can imply confidence. So if someone like fills the frame, it implies that they're quite confident. If someone's really far away from the frame, it implies they're not confident. And again, that's relevant if you're just doing little bits of filming to camera. Because if you think about yourself, if you film yourself speaking to camera and you're really far away, then the person who's watching it can't connect with you as well as if you're at a kind of comfortable distance. Um, if you're looking, um, if a camera's kind of looking down at somebody, it kind of gives this the, 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 the person who's watching it a sense that they're kind of towering over someone and it makes the person who's watching it kind of feel almost like they're kind of more dominant in a strange kind of way. Um, it makes the person who, who's on the camera looking up look a bit more weak. And then the same kind of works in reverse. If you, if you have someone who is um, looking down at you, it can be a bit intimidating because it's a bit like somebody's towering over you and sort of steering you down. Um, so you have to think about these things in terms of the, the composition and the way the position of the camera and the frame kind of um, you know implies different relationships. Now again, obviously that might come more naturally to you if you're interested in um, visual arts, um, composition, etc. Um, but it's something to think about. Um, okay, so here's a fairly straightforward one that most people should be able to follow. And if you take anything away from today, I'd recommend this rule. It's called the rule of thirds. And this is really useful for doing composition um, and framing. So basically, um, the rule of thirds works by um, dividing your frame into nine rectangles, basically a grid of nine. And um, some camera apps and some phones uh, will let you uh, do this, um, you know, just as a setting, press the button. Um, some cameras have got this built in. It's very useful. Um, basically, to sum it up as simply as possible, you can get really good results if you try and frame people along those grid lines. Um, and the reason for that is just because that's where the eye is naturally drawn to is focal points. So when you are, um, you know, just obviously uh, shooting stuff, um, if something is off of those lines, you can still get a great shot, but you're more likely to have a fantastic shot if you kind of keep to those kind of rules. Now, this isn't an absolute certainty. If you're shooting something straight to camera, you know, like right now I'm kind of in the center of the frame, um, you know, on my kind of webcam speaking to you guys. Um, but, um, you know, it depends on the context of what you're doing. If you're trying to do some creative composition, then think about it in terms of the rule of thirds. Um, it's really quite useful. Um, you also want to consider the, the eye line. Um, and that, that's obviously something we talked about previously with the kind of the, um, the, the kind of people looking up or looking down. But you also want to make sure that the eyes are kind of on the same level as the camera. So basically, if you're conducting an interview, um, if you've got somebody framed perfectly in the rule of thirds, and then you're standing up to conduct the interview, the person's going to be looking up for the whole thing. And it's going to look very strange. Or the person's going to be looking down. If you're sitting down, the person's standing. So you have to try and make sure that your eye line is kind of level with the camera. And that's how you'll get a better result. Um, you also want to think about headspace. You don't want to have too much or too little headspace above the person. Um, so normally your headspace should be, if you're talking about this in terms of a row of thirds, you want to probably have the headspace in terms of the, the top row and you want to make sure that you've not got too much or too little. Try and bear that in mind. Sometimes I see videos that people put up on their mobile phones and you know, to kind of demonstrate it, they'll be like that. They'll be like right down here or they go like that. And obviously there's a huge space above their head and it just looks super weird. Um, so the best thing to do is try and get yourself framed right. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tip, it's not a rule. Like people can do great shots that don't comply with this rule, but as a way of starting you off, um, if you're not particularly confident with composition, this is a really easy way to start. Oh, and also a good rule as well, um, generally, not necessarily something you have to stick to, but if you try and have um, uh, your focal points happening where the lines cross. So for example, um, you've got a vertical line, you've got a horizontal line. If you try and have the, the interesting points at the point where they cross. I should also say this photograph was taken by um, Simon Fox, who's a friend of mine and a really fantastic photographer. Um, he's got a calendar out, so if you're interested. Um, cool. So different types of shots. Obviously, there's different types of shots that you get when you're filming. Um, you get close-ups, you get medium shots, you get long shots. There's also ones that come in between. So you've got your extreme close-up, which might just be an eye. You've got your extreme long shot, which means somebody's really far off in the distance. 
Um, and they all do different things and they all say different things, which you can see just from those shots there. So um, if you look at the, the first one, um, it's from The Shining, uh, the close-up, it's quite intimidating, it's quite in your face. Um, if you look at the, um, uh, the second one, which is obviously Quint Eastwood and it's uh, Spaghetti Western films, um, the framing of that is obviously, you can see a bit of the landscape, you see a bit of him, it's sort of well-balanced. Um, the focus is clearly on him, but there's a bit of the background coming in as well, which kind of gives a bit of the setting. And then the last one's from The Dark Knight, when the Joker blows up the hospital, which really iconic scene, but obviously the, it's a long shot. And obviously the, the focus on that really is the destruction in the background. Um, and so those shots all have different focal points. They all say different things. A close-up is going to give you a lot of detail on a subject, and that will be the focal point. It's really effective for doing things like, um, you know, an eye or a hand or like a really subtle detail. Most shots you'll see um, just in sort of on news coverage or whatever. It's a mid shot can obviously give you a bit more uh, background, um, but it's less specific detail on the subject. Um, so obviously it's kind of a balance between the two. It's, it's really quite common. Um, and then a long shot is obviously far away. Um, it's useful for um, really dramatic things happening, um, really sort of um, you know, impressive spectacle, visual effects, um, but it's terrible for showing close-up detail. Um, so if you want to get somebody's close-up reaction, you'd probably want to have the big explosion and then cut to the, um, the close-up of the person reacting to it. Or you would do the close-up of the person reacting to it and the person's like, <gasps> And then the audience is going to say, well, what's he reacting to? And then you cut to the wide shot to see the, the, the explosion or whatever in the long shot um, or the wide shot. Um, so basically, there's, those obviously aren't hard and fast rules. Again, you can, you can play around with them. Cut between varying shots depending on the needs of what you're, you know, you're trying to do or what you're trying to convey. And again, uh, using storyboards will help you with that. Um, uh, different shot lists will help you with that. So again, if you um, aren't particularly confident, you might shoot a scene, for example, and say, oh, we're going to shoot this in close up and we're going to shoot it long. Whereas if you know what you're doing and you know the exact the sort of effect that you want to get, your storyboard says we need this shot, we need this shot, we need this shot, and you'll save yourself a lot of time because you say we need to run that shot and then we're going to that shot and then we're going to that shot rather than shooting everything close up wide, blah, 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 etc. There's also kind of um, ones that kind of go between. You get kind of combinations between the two. So you can get like a, a medium course, which is kind of where my webcam is right now it's sort of a medium course it's not close and it's not medium it's sort of in between so um yeah there's a lot of kind of uh, variations there but you're thinking a lot about what you're trying to convey and the type of shot that's best to do that will help a lot yeah so a quick recap on that um and again this is a quick activity for you to do afterwards um it'd be really useful for you to open your camera app and so i'm like okay i'll get in close up i'll get as mid i'll get it far away i'll do it with the rule of thirds I'll do it not with the rule of thirds, blah, blah, et cetera. Play about with the shots. It'll really kind of give you an idea of the variety that you can actually get. And at that point, you can start thinking about, okay, well, if I was going to turn this into a sequence, what would be the order I'd want to put the shots in? And that would then start to come more naturally to you as you go. Okay, different lens types. So this is, again, a bit more technical um, and mostly relevant for people who are using DSLRs like me. So you have different types of lens. Um, so prime is typically um, fixed um, and basically it has a lot better low light performance on average than zoom lenses. So it's fixed. So you can't zoom in on it. You're going to have to move the camera physically if you want to get a different shot. Um, zoom lens, that will give you the flexibility to zoom in. So you can see it extends a bit um, and it's great. You can obviously zoom in, it gives you flexibility, but the zoom lenses typically have a lot worse low light performance compared to um, the prime lenses. So obviously they can give you different types of shot. So for example, if you shoot with a, uh, a, a zoom lens, you have that kind of flexibility to zoom in just on the fly. Um, and if you're prime lens, you probably need to know exactly what you're shooting ahead of time. Also, you get things like digital zoom, but whatever you do, don't use that um, because digital zoom basically just, um, it just takes a part of the image and it just artificially increases it. You've probably tested this yourself on your phones at times. Most phones have got a digital zoom option and it just looks absolutely terrible. When you move into a certain point, you lose so much detail, it's just not worth doing. So the width of, of uh, lens is usually measured in millimeters. So basically I'll get a wider shot from the 25 than I will from the 35. So the smaller the number, the wider the shot, which again might seem counterintuitive. So basically um, small number is wide, large number is kind of narrow. Um, and it's usually measured in millimeters. You also have to worry about uh, light performance, as I say, um, which is measured in F or T stops. Um, basically, um, ones that perform better in low light are called faster lenses. So again, your prime lenses. So a 1.7 performs really well 
in low light, you also would have, for example, 3.5. So basically it performs decently in low light, but not as good as the 1.7, obviously. And after a certain point, it'll obviously just be too dark. So it's something to bear in mind. Um, you obviously have to adjust your camera settings to adapt for the fact that some of them work better in low light than others. Now that's just a very quick introduction to camera lenses. Um, but some of the really expensive camera lenses, like the ones you see at the bottom there, that would be like for shooting like birds or uh, lions in the wild. And basically they'll cost you, you know, potentially up to several thousand pounds because they're so you know good. Um, so that's something to bear in mind as well. Um, we'll cover more detail on some of the more advanced camera techniques that come with lenses um, when we're doing workshop three, which is the advanced stuff. Um, and that'll cover things like doing your depth of field, your shutter speed, your ISO, etc. Those are all very technical terms to do with your camera. And we'll come into that in um, part three. Um, but for now, I think it's just good enough just to have a, a sort of basic understanding of how they, how they work. Lighting is fundamentally important. It's probably the most important um, consideration after composition, and some would definitely say it's more important. So I've never underestimated how important uh, light is. Um, obviously, first of all, um, you know, we can just um, adjust the light in our surroundings, and you'd be amazed how different the light is just by making a few simple things. White is probably the thing that people get most wrong and <laughs> need to get right the best. Um, it's very difficult to fix footage afterwards. So if you have footage that's too dark, you can digitally brighten it and that's fine. Um, but um, it's obviously, you know, it could be grainy. Um, if you have footage that's too bright, you can end up with a real problem, which is when it's overexposed. The camera has lost detail on that completely because they're, the, it, the camera can't see anything. It just sees a big blob of white, basically. And you can't fix that in post. You can fix it up to a point, but you really can't fix it because the, the camera can't see any detail. Best thing to do is try and have your white balanced enough lighting behind you, enough lighting cast onto you um, is definitely more important. Um, don't film yourself from above because you'll get shadows under the eyes. Uh, don't film yourself uh, in front of a light source because you'll create a silhouette effect. The idea basically is that the background is, uh, you know, all lit up, say you're shooting next to a window, but you yourself appear as a big blob of black and you think, why is that happening? It's because basically the camera has adjusted for the light behind you and it can't see anything in front. So that's something to bear in mind as well. And if that happens to you, the best thing to do is just move the camera. You can consider using simple things like a table lamp or a ring light um, if you're recording yourself and that'll help a lot. Um, and also um, when we come into workshop three, we're gonna talk about things like really advanced stuff like um, three point light setups, like what we've got here in Buffy. And you know, Buffy's one of my favorite TV shows and I really like the lighting in Buffy, uh, particularly actually, yeah, so that's one of the things I really like about it. So you'll see here, um, there's a lot of light sources, but it's motivated lighting. Um, so for example, um, rather than just um, having the hair blend into the background, obviously there's a light source which keeps the hair illuminated and helps the character stand in the foreground. But even though it's well wet, it still manages to maintain a really kind of, kind of gloomy kind of atmosphere to it. Um, so yeah, lighting is really important and help create atmosphere and tone. So a couple of examples there, overexposed light, uh, that's on the uh, left, uh, which is from one of my short films, uh, Fatal Attractions, which I made many years ago. Uh, and uh, again, you can see that's actually after I spent hours trying to fix it <laughs> and uh, it still looks terrible um, because it was totally overexposed when, when we shot it. So the camera has lost detail and it can't really get it back because there's nothing to get back again. Um, and then obviously on the right, we've got a silhouette, which is what happens when you film in front of a light source. So you, um, you know, that could be really dramatic and create a really cool intentional effect, um, but it can also look terrible if it's not intended and you could, you know, completely miss the person. So it, it, again, another activity for you to do is just adjust the light sources in your room by turning the light on or off. And um, just by turning off a switch, you'd be amazed at the difference it can make. Um, it is actually substantially huge. Warm and cold light. Um, so again, two shots in Titanic there. You can see the difference in the, in the tone in terms of the, the mood. Um, so the warm white there, obviously, uh, is really kind of romantic and sets a kind of a nice kind of tone. Um, you have the cold white at the end in the climax. And obviously it's motivated partially by the story because, you know, presumably they are warm in the nice sun and obviously they are cold when in the water. But um, it just creates a very different tone in terms of the storytelling. Um, so usually when you're shooting, you might find this happens. You're shooting outside and your shots look really blue or you're shooting inside and your shots are really red. And that has to do with color temperature, um, which is basically measured in Kelvin. And um, natural light can oftentimes be too blue and uh, artificial light can oftentimes be too red. Now our eyes adjust for that automatically, but um, cameras don't do that. And we have to adjust the cameras accordingly. So on your phone, normally this is all automated and you can't control it. But what you can do 
if you get third party apps, which lets you adjust, like for example, the white balance of the color temperature. Now, some of you guys might have had some experience with this using things like Instagram, because you'll see the difference that actually playing about with the filters, et cetera, can make in terms of just adding warmth to an image or et cetera. Um, and it's basically the same uh, you know, principle here. The thing to adjust is white balance and color temperature. Now, um, you can adjust these things um, when you put it into editing software, but um, sometimes uh, it can be really difficult to get it right. It's better to get it as close as possible when you're actually filming. Um, and you can use the technique to tell, uh, uh, you know, to, to actually, you know, use it for story purposes, like in Titanic there. Um, and again, we can talk more about this in more detail in workshop D when we get into sort of the advanced lighting techniques where you actually do more to control it. Um, but for now, it's worth just being aware of the fact that, you know, if you're outside, you're probably going to push towards blue. And if you're inside, you're probably going to push towards red. And just to be aware that if you use a third camera app, a third party camera app on your phone or whatever, or on your camera, you'll be able to adjust accordingly and try and get a more natural kind of light. Uh, stabilization. Okay, this is quite important. Um, a lot of people are just doing handheld shots, right? And it's just, uh, you know, it just looks terrible. Um, for the purposes of filming simple stuff, um, you really just want to get a tripod. Um, obviously, different tripods are built for different weights. Um, the mobile phone ones normally are built with clips that you just sort of extend and pull. Um, good ones will let you um, tilt on the X or Y axis, but ones that are for more photography will probably just be static and don't let you move that. Um, the more money you spend on a tripod, the better it's going to be. Um, don't look at getting a cheap one for 20 quid uh, if you're putting a DSLR in it, because chances are it will fall over and break your DSLR. Um, but if you're getting a mobile phone one, this one that I'm using was like about 15 quid from Amazon. So, you know, um, tripods usually work by using um, plates or shoes. And then the way that works is you get the camera, you screw it on, normally use like a two pens or something like that on the screw, on the thread, and then you just pop it back onto the top of the tripod. Don't screw it on too tightly because you might obviously break the thread. But yeah, um, it makes a huge difference because rather than the footage bobbing around and being shaky, um, just actually spending 15 quid on a mobile phone tripod or obviously maybe a couple hundred quid plus um, this one, I think this ended up being several hundred pounds for the setup that I've got here with the slider. Um, but it makes a substantial difference. Um, it will make a huge difference to your shots, particularly if you're doing a narrative drama. Uh, I once remember sp speaking to one person um, who he gave me terrible advice and he said, do you know, I sometimes feel like using a, a tripod is cheating. Um, and I, I remember thinking to myself, like, that's, that's some of the worst advice you could possibly ever give. Because he kind of said that if you just hold it steadily yourself, then you're fine. But um, no, you want to make sure that you have a, a, a tripod because, it'll, again, it'll, it'll um, reduce strain on your arms for one thing, if you're holding something for a long period of time. Um, and it will also just make sure your shots are steady. Um, and you want to make sure it's on a balanced surface. So if you're putting it down, don't put it on, like, maybe, like, um, a patch of grass that could possibly kind of like wobble or whatever like that, try and get on a flat surface. Um, so yeah, just things to bear in mind. Oh, and be aware of wind because it might blow over. Now, if you're at home and you don't have access to all this stuff that you want to get shooting very quickly, maybe you don't have the money to invest in all this stuff, um, using your mobile phone, there's a couple of quick things you can do that might help you. So um, stand next to a window, as we say, like, um, or film next to a window. So just that's just using light within the house um, and uh, there's not any elaborate light set up. Um, for um, height, you could also just stick um, your phone on a load of books. So it's like you don't have a tripod, but you want to shoot something at a reasonable height, stick yourself on the desk, or stick, stick your phone on the desk, and uh, basically just get a bunch of books, stack it up to the height, lean the phone forward, put something behind it to obviously for it to weigh against, and then you've got a bit of height for the tripod. Those are makeshift solutions, they're not necessarily long term solutions. Um, but filming in front of a window is always a good tip if you're in an environment and you're like, how are we going to get a decent source of light? Um, film with the window casting light onto you um, or onto the subject and you'll get decent light. Um, so a good tip as well, just to be activated for you guys, is look around the room, um, see what you could use um, as a makeshift stand for extra extra camera height. Um, you'll be amazed at what you could actually use. Some people stick them on chairs, some people stick them on, um, you know, DVDs or whatever, you know, just look around, there'll be something you can stick on or an empty Amazon box. Um, okay, just moving towards the end of this now. Um, you get different mobile phone apps, which give you more control over the settings, and that's worth bearing in mind. Um, if you're using DSLR cameras or other types of video cameras, then obviously this stuff's already included. Um, but most standard camera phone apps, like that come with your Android or your iPhone or whatever, don't necessarily give you control over things like changing the lighting settings or et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's important to use a different um, app. So some of the best ones, Open Camera is free, it's on Android, and VSEO is free, and it's on iPhone. 
Um, but it's also on uh, Android, but some of the features on Android are just are bad. Filmic Pro is often considered to be the best, um, so it's worth looking at, but you do have to pay for that one. Um, but either way, it's worth getting one of these apps and using them instead, because if you're trying to get good effects on your um, your regular uh, phone app, it'll probably cause you issues, particularly because focus will shift. Um, but if we're using a, a more sort of um, an app with a bit more control over it, then we'd be able to sort of set those things so they wouldn't adjust. A few more final notes on the camera stuff. Um, aspect ratio um, basically refers to the width and height dimensions. So it's like 16 by nine for like widescreen, one by one is your square on Instagram. Um, footage is recorded as rows and columns of pixels. Um, so obviously the more pixels you have, um, the more detail you have. Um, you can get lens adapters for mobile phones. Um, they can be quite cheap, they can be quite expensive, um, but they'll give you the variety of shots that you could get instead of being able to obviously change lenses where you can with a DSLR. You can get these different adapters, which will turn your camera, uh, your mobile phone camera into a wide lens, or it'll turn your mobile phone into a, a really tight macro lens or stuff like that. You also get ND filters, which are little kind of black discs um, of glass, which will you can attach to the front of your um, camera lens, and that'll help you compensate for really, really, really bright sunlight. They come in varying strengths. You also get variable ones. I usually, I usually use variable ones, um, and again, uh, they're really handy just for compensating um, for some of the really, really harsh sunlight. Um, don't use digital filters or effects while you're recording. It's much better to add these afterwards. So if you're filming and you think, oh, I'll add this effect as I'm filming, don't do it. Get the raw footage and then apply the effect. Because if, if you're stuck with footage that has an effect applied to it, you can't really do anything with it. Um, and also bear in mind that some cameras have built-in stabilization, which helps a lot. So for example, the GH5, which I really like, has built-in stabilization. Um, some lenses also come with built-in stabilization and that helps it. So if you do ever need to shoot handheld, it will reduce the shaky effect. A very quick equipment overview. Obviously, we're talking cameras, we're talking tripods, we're talking lights. If you're just starting out, start with the simple stuff, what you've got around the house, your mobile phones, etc. More professional kit will obviously cost a lot more. You can have to spend between hundreds to thousands of pounds, particularly if you're like me and running a business doing this. Um, but obviously, just step up as you go. It's a gradual process. Rome wasn't built in a day, one by one by one. Um, further resources, there's more online. Um, most we recommend No Film School and a bunch of YouTube channels, which are really, really good. And uh, yeah, that is mostly it. And I appreciate that we're <laughs> running really tight at time. Um, but um, basically the overall thing I'd say is uh, we'll come onto the sound stuff, editing advanced techniques in the future sessions. Practice does make perfect. Um, so get your camera and start shooting. And uh, the main thing as well is probably just have fun. We focus so much on the technical side of things and trying to get it right that we often lose sight of the fact that we're actually meant to be enjoying ourselves while we're doing this. Um, if you're doing camera stuff, even if it's for work, you can get, you can get a really fun day out of it. So um, make sure you don't lose sight of that.